Chapter 14 Simon Zelotus Martyred in Britain During the Boadician War Following the defeat of Caractacus at Clune, A.D. 52, and his exile at Rome, Arviragus speedily reorganized the Salarian forces, striking back at the Romans with a fury that exceeded any former combat. Astorius Scapula was still in command of the Roman armies in Britain, but his forces had become greatly demoralized by the succession of defeats and the terrible savagery of the British onslaughts. In the year A.D. 53, Scapula suffered a staggering defeat at Cervelin near Caerleon. This was the year Nero had succeeded Claudius as emperor of the Romans. Nero accepted Scapula's resignation, and he was immediately replaced by Aulius Didius. Tacitus Annals 1240, also known as Didius Gallus. Didius founded the city of Cardiff, which is still known by the Welsh as the Castle of Didius. It is interesting to learn that one of the first acts of Didius on arriving in Britain was to depose Cardus Mandua, queen of the Brigants, whom he thoroughly distrusted. Her treacherous betrayal of her cousin Caractacus had caused her to be held in disdainful contempt by both the Romans and the British. As it was, her own clan had expelled her for adultery. Tacitus History 3.45 Didius was impotent in dealing with Arvirgus on the field of battle. He suffered repulse and defeat in rapid succession. After a brief command, he was replaced by Veranius, A.D. 57. The latter had no better success, in fact, worse. Arvirigus drove the Roman forces behind the Plaudian wall of fortresses and bottled up Veranius at Verulam. Matters in the field had become so bad for the Roman arms that, in desperation, Nero ordered huge reinforcements to be rushed to Britain under the superlative relieving command of Suetonius Paulinus. Tacitus, Annals, 1438-39 then regarded as the ablest tactician in the Roman army, he took with him the second Augusta legions and the famous ninth, fourteenth, and twentieth legions who carried the victorious legend Vesessima Valens Victrix. They were unequal to the occasion. Disaster continued as the British drove the enemy before them, asking no quarter and giving none. Tacitus bitterly expresses the feeling at Rome which required their most capable generals and finest legions to combat the, quote, barbarous, end quote, British. He writes, In Britain, after the captivity of Caradoc, the Romans were repeatedly defeated and put to rout by the single state of the Ciliars alone. Tacitus Annals 1238-39 the clemency shown the royal British captives at Rome by the Emperor Claudius did not mollify the Silurians in the least. Men, women, and priests, without discrimination, took the field to avenge and arrest the continued tyrannical persecution of Roman savagery. Ruefully, Tacitus observes, quote, The race of the Silures are not meant to be changed by clemency or severity. End quote. Ibid 224 Mercilessly they fought pitched battles, stormed forts and Roman encampments, putting Roman settlements to the torch. The record reads, quote, The plains and streets ran with Roman blood. End quote. The more the Romans were defeated, the more excessive were their vicious depredations. The culminating climax came under orders from Suetonius Paulinus to carry out a scorched earth program, to destroy everything in their path, and particularly to exterminate the seats of Christian learning and all therein. This resulted in the horrible Menai Massacre. Ibid 14, 29 through 31. Entering the community under the pretext of peace, with concealed arms, the Roman soldiery suddenly set upon the inhabitants. Thousands of unsuspecting priests and priestesses and a multitude of people were treacherously butchered in cold blood. Men, women, and children. The aged and the infants were alike hewn down without mercy. According to Tacitus, this horrible campaign raged at its worst, from A.D. 59 to 62. In the year A.D. 60, the avaricious Roman prefect Catus Decianus had broken the Claudian treaty with the Iceni on a false pretext fomented by Seneca, the Stoic philosopher, who at that time held great influence with Nero. Seneca, while renowned as a philosopher of sorts, was better known as the wealthiest man in Rome, who had obtained his vast fortune by trickery and usurious loans. 
he had advanced the huge sum of ten million dollars to Prasuticus on the security of the public buildings of the Iceni. Prasuticus, the king, was also an extremely wealthy man. Tacitus says his wealth was rated at Rome as being fantastic. However, the financial transaction was a private matter between Seneca, Prasuticus, and his family. Having no political involvement, it was outside the authority of Decinius. Nevertheless, Seneca conspired with Decinius to act on the recent death of Prasuticus, completely disregarding the valid claims of the estate. The Roman prefect needed no second invitation to satiate his greed from the pillage and plunder that would follow. This act of treachery was made more simple for Decinius by reason of an existing peace treaty made between Rome, the Iceni, and the Coraniade. This political agreement permitted the Romans to enjoy freedom of travel and residence in the domain of these two British clans. This privilege provided opportunity for Decianus to take the populace by surprise. He struck suddenly with violence, inciting his soldiers to unwarranted brutalities which appalled and drew severe censure from the Senate and Roman writers. They sacked the British palaces and public buildings of all treasure, stripping the Iceni nobles of their estates and personal wealth formally guaranteed to them by the Claudian Pact. To add to the infamy of the act, licentiousness ran rampant. Tacitus Annals 1431 The two daughters of Queen Boadicea, widow of Prasuticus, were publicly raped and Boadicea was whipped. The Menai massacre, already referred to, followed closely on the heels of this bestiality. These combined monstrosities infuriated the British beyond restraint. Tacitus Annals 1431-35 Their anger swept the length and breadth of the island with the frenzy of a vendetta. The Roman writers graphically reported that the Roman generals and soldiery alike were stunned with the avalanche of British reaction. In fright, the Romans confined their forces within their own encampments. Despite the fact that the Iceni and the Coreniade were branded as traitors for deserting Caractacus during the Claudian campaign, these atrocities brought the British clans together in a solid phalanx. The British Queen Boadicea, inflamed by the personal indignities perpetrated upon her daughters and her people, rose in militant defiance to avenge the insults. Her warriors swarmed around her, eager for the fray. She was to lead them into battle with a devastating offensive that has caused her name to flame throughout British history as the finest embodiment of Britannia. To this day, Britannia is displayed on the face of British coins in the form of a woman. Boadicea, the British name meaning Victoria, was a cousin of Claudius Pudens, thus closely related to both Caractacus and Arviragus. To Arviragus, Boadicea sent Venetius, the Pendragon of the Iceni, in an urgent appeal offering to place the combined forces of the Iceni and the Coraniade under his command. Whether he accepted or not is unstated, probably because the historic record is overshadowed by the brilliant stature of the valorous queen. We do know that her own Pendragon, Venetius, led the two warrior tribes, but only as second-in-command. Boadicea was commander-in-chief and led her warriors personally into battle. Boadicea was a born warrior chieftainess, undoubtedly the greatest warrior queen in all history. She had acquired her name Victoria by her valor in former military campaigns. Boadicea had always despised the Romans. Now she hated them with a chilling bitterness that hungered for vengeance. Historians tell us that in appearance she was a most dramatic, striking figure. The Roman writer Dion Cassius states, quote, Boadicea ascended the general's tribunal. Her stature exceeded the ordinary height of women. Her appearance itself carried terror. Her aspect was calm and collected, but her voice became deep and pitiless. Her hair, falling in long golden tresses as low as her hips, was collected round her forehead by a golden coronet. She wore a tartan dress fitting closely to the bosom, but below the waist expanding in loose folds as a gown. Over it was a clamus or military cloak. In her hand she bore a spear. Zephylinus Excerpta, page 176. Such is the portrait of the majestic Boadicea as she stood surrounded by the 120,000 warriors who had responded to her blazing call for vengeance. To them she delivered an address as challenging and to be as immortal as the one given by her famous relative, Caractacus, before the Roman Senate. Dion Cassius records this address as follows. 
I appeal to thee, a woman, I rule not like Nitocris over beasts of burden, as are the effeminate nations of the East, nor like Semiramis over tradesmen and traffickers, nor like the man-woman Nero over slaves and eunuchs, such is the precious knowledge these foreigners introduce among us. But I rule over Britons, little versed in craft and diplomacy, but born and trained in the game of war, men who, in the cause of liberty, stake down their lives, their lives of their wives and children, their lands and property, Queen of such a race, I implore thine aid for victory over enemies infamous for wantonness of the wrongs they inflict, for their perversion of justice, for their contempt of religion, for their insatiable greed, a people that revel in unmanly pleasures, whose affections are more to be dreaded and abhorred than their enmity. Never let a foreigner bear rule over me or these my countrymen. Never let slavery reign in this island. Be thou for ever, O goddess of manhood and victory, sovereign and queen in Britain. Having exhorted her followers, the famous Boadician War began in A.D. 60. Always in the fore, fiercely inspiring her warriors, Boadicea, with her two daughters riding beside her, led her armies from one devastating victory to another, the scythes on the wheels of her war chariot slashing deep into the enemy lines. Colchester was the first to fall. The temple, fortified by Roman veterans, held out two days, then disaster overtook them. The ninth legion under Petilia Cerealis was slaughtered at Cogeschal. Cerealis and a few horsemen were the only ones to escape. The Roman headquarters at Verulam was burnt to the ground and its defenders cut to pieces. It seems as though nothing could stop the furious onslaughts of the British queen. The Roman populace fled in terror on news of her armed approach. Tacticus states that one Roman legion that dared to stand ground was cut down to the last man. Tacitus Annals 1432 her forces had by then swelled to the enormous number of 230,000, clearly indicating that more than the two clans were supporting her punitive cause. It can be fairly assumed that the Silurians under Arviragus were participating in this concerted action, since the field of battle had extended into their territory. We do know that the powerful Tranobantus, the warlike clan with whom Julius Caesar signed the peace pact of September 26, 54 BC, had cast in their lot with Boadicea. Tacitus declared that the Silurian state alone had inflicted one defeat after another upon the Romans, now with at least four of the most powerful warrior clans in Britain massed together under the one standard of baneful vengeance to the number of more than a quarter of a million. There is no need for wonder why the Romans were swept ruthlessly before them. Never before had the British been so deeply wounded and angered by the violation of their native privileges, their religious institutions, and personal dignity. The desecration charged them with superhuman determination to avenge. Tacitus reports that over 80,000 Roman soldiers perished in these sanguinary battles, and Catus Decinius, terrified by the violence of the conflict and the horrible carnage he witnessed, took flight, escaping into Gaul. The greatest single carnage followed the attack on London. At that time, it was a populous city, the trade center in Britain for international commerce. It was filled with Roman merchants and was protected by a powerful Roman garrison. The assault and destruction of the city is one of the most appalling war records one can read. It was little short of a massacre and shows how intense was the merciless British fury, steeped in a hatred so unnatural to the general British character. Some may consider the quarterless slaughter performed by the British in the Boadician campaign as unwarranted and diametrically opposed to Christian principles. One should remember, however, that since the Claudian Edict for Christian Extermination beginning A.D. 42, up to and including the Boadician War of A.D. 60, the people and the land of Britain had suffered a persecution at the hands of the Romans for 18 years, which no other nation had experienced. Their towns, religious institutions, libraries, and seats of cultural learning had been burnt to the ground with a barbaric insolence unequaled. The defenseless had been massacred. Licententious pillage and plunder of wealth, crops, and cattle had been conducted, unabated in the vicious Roman pledge to crush the Christian faith and spirit in Britain. 
People can stand only so much, then anger gets the better of them, often leading to what may term an excess of violence. The British were only paying the Romans back in their own barbaric coin, and unquestionably they saved Christianity for posterity with the sacrifice of their lives and property. Some historians claim that Suetonius Paulinus, commander-in-chief of the Roman forces, terrified at the determined onslaught on London, fled the scene with a few of his troops. This is hardly conceivable. The chroniclers report that the battle for supremacy waged savagely for several days, indicating that the British encountered organized military resistance. Paulinus probably made good his escape when he saw the battle was lost, leaving the destruction of the city, its inhabitants, and such legionnaires that remained to the sword of the pitiless British. Tacitus states that 40,000 of the Roman defenders of London and its inhabitants were put to the sword and the city to the torch. Next, Boadicea leveled the important city of Verulam, now St. Albans, driving the enemy before her. Such of the inhabitants of Regnum and Rudipium as could fled before her armies arrived. It is said that the destruction of lives on both sides was so great that the burning towns and cities were quenched in blood. The British Amazon swept westward in an effort to intercept Paulinus. Dion reports many battles fought with the heavy balance of disaster borne upon the Romans. The climax to the victorious Boadician War ended in a most unpredictable manner at Flintshire, A.D. 62 where the modern town of Newmarket stands. The contesting armies had met in a savage conflict that was fought from dawn to darkness, with the battle swaying in favor of one side, then the other. As dusk set in, a section of the British army, led by Boadicea, was separated from the main body, believing herself trapped and fearing capture, even though the record states that the British forces had reorganized preparatory to a final major assault. Rather than fall into the hands of the despoilers and the rapine, she knew would follow the valorous Queen Boadicea in a last gesture of defiance, committed suicide on the field of battle. Battle. As the tragic news swept through the ranks of both sides, it is recorded that Britain and Roman alike were stunned with the calamity of this extraordinary climax. Fighting immediately ceased, with each side withdrawing into their own encampment with unbidden consent. The death of this great British queen settled like a pall over all. The woman who had terrified the Romans in life awed them in death. A great sadness descended upon her people and the Romans, quick to seize an opportunity, took advantage of the situation to come to peace terms with the Iceni. Under the terms of this new peace pact, the Romans restored all the confiscated wealth of the royalty, the nobles, and the people. The stolen estates were returned to the surviving members of the royal household and to the nobility with all their original privileges. The treacherous transaction of Seneca was cancelled, and a heavy indemnity was paid to the Iceni. How truly the Roman historian wrote, quote, every peace with the British was a signature of defeat, end quote. The royal Boadicea, majestic in appearance, rich in eloquence, dauntless in war, endowed with the military genius which for two years had outmatched the ablest strategist of Rome, drove their legions before her arms like sheep to the slaughter. The British heroine who preferred death rather than sacrifice her freedom, a warrior queen with no equal in the colorful pages of history, the avenger of womanly indignities, a champion of the Christian faith, was now no more than a glorious memory. The Romans wrote that her funeral obsequies were the most magnificent ever bestowed on a monarch. So lavish in pomp and assemblage they gazed in wonder on its splendor, awed and silence in both shame and fear. Her unhappy death, though spectacular, was an incomparable sacrifice for the preservation of the ancient British freedoms for which she stood. Boadicea's monumental record is immortalized and enshrined in the magnificent statue erected on Westminster Bridge to her memory. It is one of the finest statues to be seen anywhere in the world. Everyone who views it is impressed with its illustrious majesty. It is created exactly as the ancient Roman writer Dion Cassius described her. She stands erect, spear in one hand, and with the other hand holding in check the two rearing chargers, coronet on her brow, with her long hair flowing to the breeze. Her two daughters are kneeling beside her on the floor of her war chariot. 
her noble features proudly portray the cast of her fearless character on the wheels of her chariot are shown the terrible scythes which were a deadly slashing war weapon peculiar to the british armaments dreaded by the romans the sculptor who executed the statuary was truly inspired with the commission it depicts christian britannia on the shores of england defying the evil powers of the world the scene of battle and its tragedy over the centuries are commemorated by place names known to this day as cop paulinus hill of arrows hill of carnage hollow of no quarter hollow of woe hollow of execution field of the tribunal knoll of the melee on the scene still exists a monolith called the stone of lamentation described as the spot where the great queen took her life on the road to carowis was the stone of the grave of boadicea since moved to downing the conflict against the romans did not cease with her death the roman peace made with the iceni had no effect on other british clans it is written that her tragic death did not abate the punitive spirit and campaigning determination of the britons in the north and the west under the invincible leadership of arviricus venusius and the gallant new pentagon galgacus hostilities vigorously continued against the romans tacitus agricola thirty through thirty two but through it all they glimpsed triumph strong in their faith that the cause of christ was safe for all time in the embattled island realm greater sacrifice and heroism was yet to be suffered for christian welfare but the flag of christ was never to dip to any pagan power in pinson's metrical life of st joseph the following lines occur referring to the death of mary the mother of jesus quote, so after her assumption the book telleth plain with st philip he went to france philip bade them go to great britain fortunate End quote these lines inform us that after the death of mary joseph returned to gaul with philip his dearest friend the last line rather implies that philip was fortunate in prevailing on joseph to return to britain this would suggest that joseph bowed in sorrow was loath to part from the man who was so close to him that he could understand his grief knowing that work was the best antidote for sorrow philip urged his friend to return to his mission in britain where he was so greatly needed not only was philip fortunate in persuading joseph britain was fortunate to receive him back it will be noticed that the word them is employed in the last line who were them the word is plural the answer is provided in the magna tabula glastoniae cited by bishop usher every time joseph went to gaul he returned with more missionary helpers on this occasion we are told that among them was his son josephus whom philip had baptized how long josephus stayed in britain with his father is not stated but from various records it is quite evident that the son of joseph journeyed as an emissary between gaul and britain facts show that josephus returned to gaul after arriving in britain with his father at philip's request joseph remained in britain as the head of the missionary band at avalon in the year a d sixty special mention is made of joseph going to gaul and returning to britain with another band of recruits among whom is particularly mentioned simon zelotes one of the original twelve disciples of christ this is the second time it is especially mentioned that philip consecrated joseph and his band of co-workers prior to embarking for britain probably the inclusion of simon zelotes indicated an important missionary effort hence the consecration this was the second journey to britain for simon zelotes and his last according to cardinal baronius and hippolytus simon's first arrival in britain was in the year a d forty four during the claudian war evidently his stay was short as he returned to the continent nisiphorus patriarch of constantinople and byzantine historian a d seven fifty eight through eight twenty nine writes quote, simon born in cana of galilee who for his fervent affection for his master and great zeal that he showed by all means to the gospel was surnamed zelotes having received the holy ghost from above travelled through egypt and africa then through mauritania and all libya preaching the gospel and the same doctrine he taught to the occidental sea and the isles called britanniae see also dorotheus synod de apostle in the bible simon is often referred to as simon the canaanite because he came from cana 
The Hebrew word for zealous has a similar sound to that of his hometown being Cana. The Greek translation of the word is Zelotes, the name by which he is best known. His enthusiastic preaching of the word earned him his zealous surname. Simon arrived in Britain during the first year of the Boadician War, A.D. 60, when the whole island was convulsed in a deep, burning anger against the Romans, which was never equaled before or after in the long years of conflict between the two nations. Tacitus states that from A.D. 59 to 62, the brutalities of war were at their worst. Atrocities occurred on both sides, but the Romans carried their vicious perpetrations to such an extent that even Rome was shocked. Bearing this in mind, we can readily understand that any Christian evangelizing outside the British shield would be fraught with imminent danger. At all times the disciples of Christ were oblivious to danger, but when the pressure became too severe, invariably they fled the land until matters quieted down. In the year A.D. 44, a Claudian edict expelled the Christian leaders from Rome. Many of them sought sanctuary in Britain. Among those who fled to Britain from Rome was Peter. Cornelius a Lapide, Argumentum Epistolo St. Pauli de Romanos, Chapter 16. This was the year Simon first went to Britain. He did not come from Rome, but from Gaul, where he had been assisting Philip. Moreover, Simon was directly associated with the Arimathean mission of Avalon on both his missionary efforts in Britain. As we shall later see, it made quite a difference to the British in their acceptance of him, whether the missionary came from Rome or Jerusalem. Simon was unusually bold and fearless, as his surname implies. In spite of the volcanic turmoil seething through Britain during the Boadician War, Simon openly defied the barbaric edict of Paulinus and the most brutal Catus Decenius to destroy anything and anyone Christian. He decided to conduct his evangelizing campaign in the eastern part of the island. This section of Britain was sparsely inhabited by the native Britons and consequently more heavily populated by the Romans. It was far beyond the strong protective shield of the Silurian arms in the south and the powerful northern Yorkshire Celts. In this dangerous territory, Simon was definitely on his own. Undeterred with infinite courage, he began preaching the Christian gospel right in the heart of the Roman domain. His fiery sermons brought him speedily to the attention of Catus Decenius, but not before he had sown the seed of Christ in the hearts of Britons and many Romans who, despite the unremitting hatred of Decenius for all that was Christian, held the secret of the truth locked in their hearts. The evangelizing mission of Simon was short-lived. He was finally arrested under the orders of Catus Decinius. As usual, his trial was a mockery. He was condemned to death and was crucified by the Romans at Caister, Lincolnshire, and there buried circa May 10, A.D. 61. The day of martyrdom of Simon Zelotus, the devoted disciple of Christ, is officially celebrated by the Eastern and Western Church on May 10, and so recorded in the Greek monology. Cardinal Baronius, in his Annales Ecclesiasticae, gives the same date in describing the martyrdom and burial of Simon Zelotus in Britain. Of Simon Zelotus, Dorotheus, Bishop of Tyre, A.D. 300, writes in his Synopsis de Apostle, quote, Simon Zelotus traversed all Mauritania and the region of the Africans preaching Christ. He was at last crucified, slain, and buried in Britain, end quote. There are some who think that because Simon Zelotus perished in Britain, he must have been slain by the British. This could not be at all possible. Only the Romans practiced crucifixion. In the first place, this form of death was reserved as a gesture of contempt in executing their meanest criminals. During the Christian era, it was more viciously employed on the Christians in defiant mockery of all the cross stood for to all Christians. To the British, and indeed to all Christians, crucifixion was a profanity of the cross. The historic record leaves no doubt as to who crucified Simon Zelotus. Some also entertain the belief that Simon Zelotus was the first British Christian martyr. Of the elect, he was the second British martyr. Aristobulus, brother of Barnabas and father-in-law of Peter, was the first to be martyred in Britain. Aristobulus preceded Simon to his reward at what is now St. Albans by a couple of years. The record states he was martyred, quote, in the second year of Nero, end quote. This would be circa A.D. 59. Unknown to many, the remains of Simon Zelotus, with many more of the saintly elect, are buried in England, creating the saying uttered the world over, quote, Britain, the most hallowed ground on earth, end quote. 
the year before the Boadician War and the two years of its existence, admitted by Rome to be marked with unparalleled horror, are the darkest, most blood-stained years in British history through Roman infamy, yet they are epic years in British Christian annals, resplendent with noble sacrifice and heroic deeds, outmatching the terror and stark tragedy those years contained. To this notable period, the martyrdom of Simon Zelotus added the luster in his last devotional act in serving his master, with whom he first walked on the shores of Galilee. Nearby where this noble martyr perished was the ancestral home of Abraham Lincoln, the great American Christian president. His ancestors migrated from England in the first waves of English colonists to settle in Virginia. The church in which Lincoln worshipped was made an American sanctuary by patriotic, Christian-minded American soldiers of World War II. They made various beautiful contributions to this ancient little church at Boston, Lincolnshire, to the memory of the family, particularly to their illustrious American descendant. Eighteen hundred years after the martyrdom of Simon Zelotus, in the land of the Lincolns, in America, Abraham Lincoln became a martyr for his humane Christian principles, the same principles which Simon Zelotus taught, for which he was crucified, and gave his all in the glorious service of his beloved Jesus. Oh.